I'm Peter Scott. And I'm Natalie McCallum. And this is Spoke TV, your source for local weekly news produced by second year journalism broadcast students from Conestoga College. On Friday, France and the rest of the world was left in shock after the terrorist attacks in Paris. The attacks, six in total, included suicide bombers of the France-Germany soccer match as well as mass shootings. This sent tremors throughout the world as the world watched and prayed for Paris. On Sunday, Kitchener held a vigil to support Paris and for people to show their respects. Reporter Carmen Ponciano was on site to grieve with locals. The city of Kitchener didn't waste any time after the Paris attack to gather its citizens together. From young to old. Many gathered on Sunday evening in front of Kitchener City Hall to pay their respects for those who died in the attacks that happened Friday. The vigil started at 7 p.m. as Mayor Barry Vervanovic expressed his sympathies. We have a wonderful opportunity to not only stand together as the Waterloo Region community, but to stand united with our friends around the world in cities like Paris, like Beirut, like Baghdad, and other places. For Spoke TV, I'm Carmen Ponciano. The meaning of Remembrance Day varies between ages, but the one thing that remains the same is showing respect to those who fought for our freedom. Ali Sieber Payton talked to a local cadet group to discuss what is most important to them. Hespler Road in Cambridge celebrated Remembrance Day like many other towns do at the Cenotaph. Many gathered around with their family and friends while joining the community in prayers and songs. Originally formed in 1812, one of the oldest Army Cadet Corps in Canada has been planning for this day for a while. Every Monday, the 21 Royal Highland Fusiliers practice to make sure every turn is on point. Um, so last week we had a huge like practice on drill, so marching and just a bunch of stuff that we're going to be doing. Um, on Wednesday just to go with, along with the um, Remembrance Day um, parade and stuff. Other than that, classes are kind of proceeding as normal and we've just started wearing the poppy. Many cadets and captains have a personal connection with Remembrance Day, young and old. For me, actually, it's, um, it, it's an emotional time. I lost a couple of colleagues in Afghanistan. Uh, I lost some friends who died in a helicopter crash in training. That means a lot, like my grandpa, he was in the reserves like a while ago. Like, I like to honor the people's families that like lost people. Well, what it means to me, um, I had a, a grandfather um, and a great uncle, a couple great uncles that were in, in World War II. Um, so it's a, it's a big part of my life, it always has been. Um, I had an uncle that was actually on a ship that was sunk. He was one of the survivors. Many gathered around their local cenotaph, where wreaths were laid and memories will forever march on. From Spoke TV, I'm Ali Sieber Payton. Thanks, Allie. In Guelph, cats don't need to be registered. This leads to many lost cats not being returned to their owners and ending up at the Humane Society. That may soon change. Sarah McKeever takes a look at this issue. The city of Guelph is proposing a program that is very uncommon, a cat license. A formal review process has been ongoing for nearly a year for animal-related bylaws. Currently, only dogs have to be licensed in Guelph and have their tags renewed every January. Dogs must be spayed or neutered, and dog owners will save money on licensing fees if their animals are microchipped. On average in Guelph, only 13% of cats brought in as strays actually get returned to their homes. The rest, if they're well enough, go through the adoption center. Megan Swan is the SPCA officer with the Guelph Humane Society and says licensing program for cats can only benefit the animals and their owners. By introducing a licensing program for cats, we're really hoping that we can reduce the number of homeless cats here in the city of Guelph and also help owners get their cats home sooner. Hundreds of cats come through the Humane Society every year, but very few of them actually get picked up by their rightful owners if they're astray. The licensing program in Guelph will likely help alleviate that situation and get more cute little guys like this back to their rightful owners. Trevor Spencer is a volunteer with the Guelph Humane Society and is in full support of the potential new program. I think there's a lot of stray cats in Guelph that people don't realize are stray cats and I think a license will, will be a good idea because like if the cat is, like they'd be, they have the microchip in it or whatever and I think that would be really well for the animals. At this time in the review process, it is unknown what the costs will be to license a cat. The Guelph Humane Society has a voluntary licensing program for cats on their website already, with fees similar to those for the dog program. If the new bylaw takes effect, all cat owners and dog owners alike will be asked to register their furry friends. For Spoke TV, I'm Sarah McKeever. Thanks, Sarah. Construction within the KW region is increasing due to the new light rail transit. Not only is it slowing commutes, but it's also taking a toll on emergency vehicles. Matt Bentley has more. 
Emergency personnel are essential to the city. One of their main responsibilities is responding to an alert and getting to the scene in a quick fashion. However, their ability to do that isn't always the easiest. With the construction of the LRT ramping up over the last few months, it can be difficult for first responders to get to the scenes when roads are either closed off or reduced to one lane. Construction can be a big problem for emergency personnel, especially firefighters whose big fire trucks can have a tough time getting through roads reduced to one lane. A big road, such as Northfield Drive, located in Waterloo, is currently being constructed with an upgraded bridge in order to carry LRT tracks. Due to this, lanes on the road and ramps going onto the Conestoga Parkway will be closed through 2016. Ryan Schubert, Deputy Fire Chief of Station 4 for Waterloo Fire Rescue, gave his perspective on just how they deal with the construction. We uh, work quite closely with uh, light rail transit with the region. Uh, in addition, our transportation division provides regular updates of, uh, of current closures and also prospective closures that we need to plan for in the future. So um, certainly communication is an important uh, piece to our ability to uh, respond and have a situ situational awareness and crews uh, to have an understanding of where those closures are. With construction slated to continue until 2017, emergency services will have to keep adapting to changing road conditions. For Spoke TV, I'm Matthew Bentley. Diwali is one of the biggest celebrations in India. Being the festival of lights, it only seems appropriate that fireworks would be included in the celebrations. But until recently, fireworks were not allowed in Cambridge backyards during Diwali. Spoke TV's Struthi Rajagopalan explains. The sky in Cambridge got a lot brighter this year on Diwali compared to the previous years with people setting off fireworks in their backyards. That's because Cambridge grocery store owner Sarpreet Singh asked City Council to consider allowing fireworks during the Hindu festival this year, just like others are allowed to do during Victoria Day and Canada Day. Council then unanimously approved the request. Sarpreet Singh explained why it was important for him to allow fireworks in the city. Our sixth Guru, Guru Hargobind Sahib, they are in a prison from a long time and he came back from the prison with 52 more kings, they released in the same day. On arrival of them, everybody put the lights on near to the home. So we make the way lightning. And after the certain times, the fireworks introduced. So people are doing the fireworks to celebrate the same day. Waterloo, Brampton, Milton and Guelph already allow fireworks during Diwali. Kitchener allows fireworks only on Victoria and Canada Day. Cambridge City Councillor Nicholas Ermata talks about why fireworks are not permitted in Kitchener. Each municipality has their own bylaws that, you know, like we're all governed independently. So, uh, you know, maybe the community in Kitchener might want to step forward or a member of that council could come forward and, and take the initiative. As you can see behind me, a lot of people have gathered at the Brahma Rishi Mission of Canada to celebrate Diwali this year. People are welcome to use fireworks in their backyard on Victoria Day and Canada Day. Why is it still not permitted on Diwali is the big question. For Spoke TV, I'm Shruti Rajagopalan. Thanks, Shruti. When you think of Christmas, reindeer and snowman decorations seem to come to mind. With Starbucks sticking to a simple red cup, controversy has begun to take over social media about them disregarding the holiday. Carla Buella looked deeper into this. It looks like a simple red cup, but it's not. People are now taking to social media to use hashtag it's just a cup to respond to the criticism that Starbucks is now creating a war on Christmas. Over the years, Starbucks has offered holiday lattes in a festive red cup with Christmas ornaments, reindeers and snowflakes. This year, they've changed the cup into a plain red with nothing but the familiar green Starbucks logo. But what about other coffee company? What can they say about the issue? They're trying to market to people who don't celebrate Christmas as well, as well as people who do celebrate Christmas. So by doing, we're not putting so much Christmas on their cup, it kind of markets to everybody. Whereas we put Christmas cups, not everybody would celebrate it. It's not, maybe they got mad, I don't know. Some Christians are taking it against Starbucks so open-minded our brains have literally fallen out of our head do you realize that starbucks wanted to take christ and christmas off of their brand new cups that's why they're just plain red but cory cole 
A child educator says that Starbucks Red Cup is helping them to teach children how to be creative. Our traditions would probably be just be how children see what a holiday means, especially in, in the community where I work. Um, there's children from all over the world, um, and, and so each cup would be indicative of different holiday traditions from where they're from. Planer printed it doesn't matter for as long as the coffee tastes the same. For Spoke TV, I'm Carla Buella. Thanks, Carla. In downtown Kitchener, one church has a holiday tradition that has lasted over 60 years. And the best part is, it involves pudding. But maybe not the kind that people are used to. Downtown Kitchener, at St. John the Evangelist Church, they have a tradition that has carried on for 67 years. Every November, the church makes Christmas pudding. Their tradition originally started with the women of the church. But as it grew in popularity, the demand for volunteers grew and now men of the church as well as community volunteers are needed to work the two shifts in order to keep up with the orders. This year, pre-order sales reached over 2,000 pounds, but if you did not order any and still want some pudding, they also made extras for sale. As soon as November 1st hits, it's not uncommon to see stores immediately change from Halloween to Christmas. But what about the day that falls between these two holidays? Some think it's in their best interest to refrain from lights until after Remembrance Day. With Remembrance Day now having passed, many store windows are now lit up with Christmas lights and have begun the holiday season. Orangeville decided last February that it was not acceptable for lights to be hung before Remembrance Day and until it ended. Sticking to it, they banned lights in their downtown core until November 12th. Some agreed that this was a way of showing respect to veterans, but some people voiced their opinions, including some veterans, saying that they fought for their freedoms, which included hanging their Christmas lights. Waterloo Region will be getting a new semi-pro basketball team. Tryouts are still ongoing, with their opening game scheduled for December the 18th. Spoke TV's Alex Spears has more on this. With the recent success of the Toronto Raptors and an abundance of Canadian talent in the NBA, basketball is becoming increasingly popular in Canada. Players like Cleveland's Tristan Thompson, as well as former number one picks Anthony Bennett of the Raptors and Andrew Wiggins of the T-Wolves, have young players in Canada feeling like they can turn basketball into more than a hobby. Basketball, in fact, is becoming so popular in the Tri-Cities that the city of Waterloo will be the home to a semi-professional basketball team in the new Canadian Basketball League. The team held tryouts this past weekend at Rim Park, quickly trying to get organized as the season starts in December. In recent reports, it has been said that the city of Waterloo will be providing some of the funding for the team. But Clarence Butch Carter, former head coach of the Raptors and current Canadian Basketball League president, says that the city will not be providing any funding. He has declined to be interviewed. With a new semi-pro basketball team preparing to play in the Tri-Cities, it has local talent throughout the region thinking that maybe they have a chance to play when they're done school. Noel Hallaby, a Conestoga College student, says that he enjoyed watching the London Lightning of the National Basketball League of Canada, and he thinks that a semi-pro team is a great idea in the Tri-Cities. It is exciting. It will... It will, uh, basketball throughout Canada, the culture has increased with uh, fan base and, you know, the Raptors as well as, it's, it's getting more popular with the sub leagues such as NBL, so I think it's great for the city. In their first season, the team will play 14 home games at the Waterloo Memorial Recreation Complex. As of right now, the team does not have an official name. For Spoke TV, I'm Alex Spears. Thanks, Alex. A local singing competition, much like Canadian Idol called The Shot, set out again this year in hopes of finding local talented vocalists for their third season. Amanda Hewson went to the show's finale and talked to participants and judges. The Shot returned this year in Kitchener to search for local talented vocalists. This Saturday, eight finalists competed for the winning title. Auditions and callbacks were done at local colleges in the Tri-City area. The finale tonight is taking place at the Conrad Center in downtown Kitchener. The finalists competed in front of a live audience Saturday night, where the crowd got to decide the grand winner of $25,000. Bobby Skongak, a Conestoga College student, was among the final four picked by the judges. It's been a great experience. Um, I mean, I've met a lot of really cool people, like like-minded people, and um, the judges slash mentors, they're, they're great, they're really helpful and supportive and um, they really want us to succeed. The competitors are paired with a mentor for the duration of the season, one of the judges that guides them through vocal warm-ups, picking appropriate songs and encouragement through the nerve-wracking finale. 
When my go-guitarist Janet Yetkiner was a judge on this season and gave a little inside peek as to what the judges are looking for in their winner. We look for compassion. We look for people who are in, in this, not for just the business part or, you know, it's people who are passionate and we want people who are in love with music, nothing else. Season three of The Shot officially came to a close this Saturday evening with the talented James Lintag taking home the grand prize. Congratulations goes out to all contestants this year. For Spoke TV, I'm Amanda Hewson. Thanks, Amanda. That's all we have for you this week. For Spoke TV from Conestoga College, I'm Peter Scott. And I'm Natalie McCallum. For more news and information, visit SpokeTV.ca or follow us on Twitter.